So on strategies to combat misinformation about climate change, I mean, first of all, before we beat each other up, um, I think we should really note that the communication of climate change has been vastly successful. You know, look, we're all here talking about climate change. There's climate change news and information all around the world. And 20 years ago, when I started out in this field, that wasn't the case. So in Europe, for example, I'm a, I'm a data-driven person, so I can only ever give evidence. Um, yeah, we're in the 80% of people concerned about climate change, actually worried about climate change. And worry is, is actually the word used in when they're interviewed. And even just recently in April in the UK, um, you know, the height of pandemic lockdown, 66% uh, of people in the UK still thought that climate change was of equal concern to co as COVID. So quite clearly we have done, or we being sort of a collective of people randomly involved in climate change communication without any central coordinating hub or anything like that, um, have been you know, vastly successful. There's the Paris Agreement of 2015. There's climate change acts around various countries. I can see the rise of renewable electricity in the annual assessment of the global carbon budget, which is one of the things we do, how much CO2 has gone into the atmosphere. Nothing I've just said was true uh, 20 years ago. And, you know, so the, the, the change is, is, is significant. Um, and what are the biggest risks of disinformation? I think it's, for me, working within scientific institutions, Ricardo just did a very nice job of sort of listing the organisations I've worked for, um, and it's the erosion of trust in institutions. Information and dissemination is all about trust. Do we trust the source of where that came from? And that's bigger than, bigger than anything else. And the in, in terms of people making sense of information, do they trust where it, where it came from? And what misinformation does and disinformation really, it challenges that trust and it erodes that trust in the source of information, that, that, that value. And uh, yeah, it's even been shown in research that people who don't believe disinformation are still influenced by the fact that they saw the disinformation. So strategy number one is don't disseminate, don't amplify misinformation or disinformation. People do it all the time on Twitter and Facebook and social media. You know, their algorithms absolutely are designed to be clickbait to get people to amplify. So if people, if somebody says something stupid or something you know isn't true, do not respond by saying, oh, this person spoke a load of um, untruths, this isn't the case, just ignore it. Do not give the oxygen of publicity on a very personal level um, to uh, your friends who are just wanting to check their Twitter feed over the coffee in the morning. They don't need this um, sort of doom coming into their feeds. Um, and my next set of strategies will really be um, taking responsibility for how you are heard and not amplifying misinformation and disinformation comes into that. Now, the first one is pay attention to cognitive bias. Cognitive bias is us accumulating information all the time that supports our worldview and our self-perception. It's all the media we read, we listen to, the people we follow on social media, the music we listen to, and even the bars that we go to. I don't know if anybody remembers bars, I'm very thirsty. Um, and uh, psychological distance. So that's the climate change, the narrative for climate change is mostly, it's happening a long time in the future, far, 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 uh, far in, a, in a country far away to um, somebody you will ever meet. Well, that's not really true. It's, it, it's happening now, it's, it's, the, it's the here and now. Um, so uh, pay attention to psychological distance, that it's not just a future problem, it's an issue now. And of course, the co-benefits of clean air, clean energy, green jobs are for the now as well as for the future. And my last one there is about embracing values. Um, we Values are what drives us all, our universal values, the beliefs we hold to our heart and everybody underestimates everybody else in terms of their motivations. And what I mean here is we know from research that most people have 
uh, self-transcending values around environmental protection, justice, equity, equality. But we think that everybody else is only driven by power and wealth. Yeah, and it's and in fact by uh, uh, tying to the values that people are aware of, that people do hold to their hearts, which is effectively environmental values. Um, you know, we do a much better job than uh, appealing with our with our messages and our information to to around sort of power and wealth and 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 competition. And I'll just there's quite a lot to that, but just think of people's values when we're engaging with them. Um, and you can check that out. It's a guy called Shalom Schwartz. These universal values have been tested in 90 something countries now, and they hold true in all of the countries where it's tested. So these self-transcending uh, self values are universal. Don't underestimate your audience. And uh, I think maybe I'll finish there. That was four, four things to be thinking about um, in, in terms of our strategies.